everyone. I want to welcome you all to our Global Harvest Church Good Friday evening service. Uh, I hope you are doing well. I hope the Lord has been blessing you and nourishing your soul through his word and encouraging you. I hope that you're able to connect with your family, connect with your home group members, connect with the church, connect with your neighbors. Uh, this is truly an opportunity for us to go deeper. Uh, not to back off, not to sit on our hands, but to actually pursue and press on. And so I just want to encourage you in that. Uh, but again, just welcome. Welcome to our service today. I want to go straight into it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. That's Luke chapter 23, verses 32 43. I'm just going to read. Uh, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Verse 35. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the, his chosen one. The soldier, soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for just this platform where we can still engage and hear your word and, and connect, Lord, even if it is through the internet, through our, um, our web. And so I just pray that today um, that you would unify our hearts and our minds, that your word would just draw us together as one body, as believers, and that we would exalt you, that we would learn something about you, um, that we would engage with you, but your Holy Spirit, would you just come and prompt our hearts towards a deeper faith and a deeper obedience and willingness to follow after you, God? Uh, we want to honor you and lift you up today. So be with us, be with me as I preach as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I do want to thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm sure um, many of you are well-versed in what took place 2000 years ago on Calvary. I'm sure you understand the method of torture uh, that is the crucifixion. I'm sure uh, most of you have seen that movie by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ. And so you have somewhat a, of a good visual understanding of, of the anguish that Christ had to endure and the hostile atmosphere as people shouted, crucify, crucify, crucify. But there's still so much to consider here because uh, I want to focus today on the words that were spoken that day at Jesus and from Jesus. See, they accused and they sneered at Christ. Uh, they sneered at him for not being able to rescue himself. They said he saved others, uh, so let him save himself if he really is Christ, the Son of God, the Chosen One. And so the soldiers also cried out and mocked him, if you're the King of the Jews, save yourself. Right? Uh, one criminal even mocked him. He said, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself or save us too. Like, if you are who you say you are, then prove it, right? Prove it, Jesus. If you're God, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Messiah, then prove it. Now, don't we do that in our lives? In a moment of trouble or confusion, don't we immediately ask God, Lord, prove your existence. Like, prove your love for me. Prove that you are who you say you are. Who, uh, that you are who you say you are. If you really love me, then prove it by giving me like that job. If you really love me, if you really care for me, then prove it by giving me that spouse or give me that or give me children or give me happiness or give me uh, peace or give me health or give me success or wealth or heal me from my pain or give me just an ease of life. Like if you really if you really love me, God, if you're really God over my life, then prove it. And folks, when we raise these kinds of thoughts, right, and we raise these kinds of questions or really rather demands to the Lord, 
That's not asking evidence. That's not asking for evidence of his love or his faithfulness. Do you know what that is whenever we say these things? That's, a, that's really, that's just straight up unbelief. That's when we as so-called believers are really crying out in faithlessness. When we say, God, prove yourself. Prove yourself. So what's happening here? All these accusations are being thrown up at Jesus. People are saying, prove yourself. If you're really him, then prove yourself. Step down, save yourself, save us. Now, was Jesus a phony? Was he really incapable of saving himself and saving those around him? I mean, how amazing that at that moment, as our Christ hung on the cross, that he was fulfilling the greatest prophecies ever made about the Messiah. Like right before the witness of the religious so-called experts, right? Their Christ, their Messiah, their King was. Right before them, the promised Savior, the King of Kings, fulfilling all that people have been waiting for and yearning for and praying for. Like in Psalm 22, 16, he fulfills the prophecy of his hands and his feet being pierced. In Isaiah 53, 5, he fulfills the prophecy of hanging between two criminals. In Psalm 22, 18, he fulfills the prophecy of his garments being divided up and his clothes, lots were casted. In Psalm 22, 7 through 8, he fulfills the prophecy where they would mock him and hurl insults at him and, and shake their heads. Jesus wasn't unable to save himself. Jesus refused to save himself, to save you, to save them, to save us all. But why? He refused to save himself so that he could save you and I because we are the guilty. You and I, we're guilty. The people are guilty. The people saying, crucify him. People are saying, prove yourself. They were guilty because in verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't get it. They don't get it. Forgive them, Lord. Isn't it interesting? Like the Jewish leaders and the, and the Romans, they certainly looked like they knew what they were doing, right? They knew they led Jesus through all these uh, illegal trials. They knew Jesus was innocent. They knew that. And yet they continued on with the trials. They continued on with this crucifixion. So what did Jesus mean when he said, forgive them? They know not what they do. When Jesus said that they don't know what they were doing, he wasn't accusing them of like a lapse of judgment. He wasn't accusing them of, you know, uh, just kind of forgetting at that moment. No, he was accusing them of their ignorance of God's greater plan. Of God's greater plan. In other words, their blindness and their hatred and their jealousy obscured their understanding of what God was doing in their midst. And ignorance, folks, is not an excuse. It's not an excuse. Those who crucified him, they may have sinned in ignorance, yet we know from Ephesians chapter 4 that they're still held accountable for their actions. Just because you say, I didn't know, does not mean that God will excuse you. You know, there was a story of Benjamin Franklin, and the streets were dark around his home, and, and the citizens, they had to kind of tread carefully, and you had to, you know, the, 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 the roads were cobbled stones and there were just there were potholes everywhere. And, and because it was dark, like you would, and there were obstacles, clearly, like you would never just like run or, 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 or walk fast. I mean, if you do that, then you'd probably hit something, crack your head open, all that stuff. So what Franklin did was like he, he lit a lantern at his home's post. And so what would happen is naturally people would see that and they would kind of walk towards that light and naturally kind of gravitate towards his home and they would use that light to kind of direct their path as they kind of headed out. And so soon what happened was after that lantern was lit, his neighbor lit a lantern in front of their own home post. And then it just continued on to the point where it started to illuminate these small streets and then all of a sudden these neighborhoods and then the village areas soon providing safe travel for all these people, ignorance doesn't excuse us because we have the light of God to expose our path. You know, when we cry, I don't know what's there. I don't know. I don't know God. We need to understand that to know God is to know him through scripture. And we have to get that. And I think if we keep seeking after these mountaintop experiences, you'll be 
kind of discouraged because that's not where you meet God. You meet God here. You meet God in His Word. His light is available to us all. And the Word is a light, is a light to our path. Willful sins are sins, but the sins of ignorance are also sins too, without excuse, because willful or not, we know that there is no good person out there. There isn't. There is no such thing as a perfectly righteous, blameless person out there. There is no one in this world who is good enough or who is innocent enough to save themselves. Who was Jesus dying for then? It was for those Jewish leaders. He was dying for those Roman executioners, the ignorant and the willful. And Jesus, he refused to save himself so that he could save those who were before him, those who were chanting, crucify, crucify, crucify. If, if Jesus was even willing to forgive them, these people who were mocking and these people who were insulting him, these people who were chanting, crucify, they wanted him dead. If Jesus could forgive them, then folks, there is hope. There is hope for everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen. There is hope for everyone. There is even hope for the family member or the friend who is antagonistic towards God. There is hope even for that maybe that child who does not know the Lord or, or that sibling of yours who seems so far off the path. Your past sins, no matter how great, no matter how severe they may have been, does not and will not determine your future. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. You are not unforgivable. Do you hear me? You are not unforgivable because no sin can ever compete with the forgiveness of God. And His forgiveness is deep and His love is great. And out of all these sea of willful and ignorant sinners mocking and humiliating and beating and rejecting their only salvation, there was one. There was one who makes this really amazing turn. Really astounding. Like in the midst of all this onslaught, anger, and violence, and hatred, and rebellion, there's this one that stood in humility. In verse 43, we read of Jesus' words to the thief. I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Here's this guy who lived a life of crime. Like he even admits that he's a bad guy and that he deserves to die. Like what could he have possibly done to make any changes to his life at that moment? He was hanging on in the last hour of his life. Like what could he have possibly done to change his fate? And the answer to that is nothing. Absolutely nothing. So here's a breakdown of what this second criminal did, okay? And this breakdown really shows us what it means for you and I even as believers, but you and I, what it means for us to get right back into good standing with the Lord before the Lord. First is this, is that this criminal, he went against the flow. Like it took courage to defy the influence of his friends and the mockery of the leaders. And it took faith for him to trust in a dying king, right? Like when you consider all that he had to overcome, the faith of this criminal is pretty astounding here because here, here, here is a reminder that we, you and I, we have to stand our ground so we don't get sucked in by the crown. crowd. The second criminal did not get deceived by all this talk, by all this mocking, by all the influence and the pressure of the people around him. Second, he rebuked the first criminal saying, don't you fear God? Right? We get that in verse 40. In other words, the second criminal did fear God. Like he had a holy fear of the Lord. God was real to him. Is God real to you? Like God was real to him. He knew God, not just as some distant figure, but man, like, yeah, you're real. You're almighty and you're the creator. Third, notice his admission that he's a sinner. He says in verse 41, we are getting what our deeds deserve. Like I'm a sinner, he's saying. Not only that, but he admits to being the worst kind of sinner. He says, I, I, I admit to being a criminal. Like, I do home invasions. I burglarize. I rob and all the stuff, all the messy, horrible, sinful things that go with it. Like, how often do we ever hear that kind of talk today? People, they're always ready to maybe admit their mistakes by kind of disguising it as like an error in judgment, you know? Like, hey, yeah, I made this mistake because of this 
right? Because there was a miscommunication, therefore, my bad type of thing, right? And so on and so forth. Instead of laying down their self-righteous defenses, they devise, right? Redevise every possible means and manageable to avoid any type of admission of sin and guilt, but not the second criminal. Mm -mm. He was on the cross, right? He was on the cross. It wasn't before the cross. He was on the cross. In other words, he was already on display for the entire world to see. There was no more cover-up. He was fully naked and transparent. He was, there's no cover up. There's no more deceit. No more trying to save face. No more trying to hide his true condition from this all-knowing God. He didn't care what the people thought anymore. No, the second criminal shows us the proper way to go. The only way to go, and that was to acknowledge our sin. Acknowledge your sin and cry out to God for mercy and help. But not only that, fourthly, not only did the second criminal admit to his guilt and his wrongdoing, but he accepted his punishment as something he deserved. He accepted it too. We are punished justly, he says in verse 41. Like there was no cry of protest. There was no like, this is unfair or anything like that. Rather, he was just humble before God. And he's like, I did wrong. I deserve whatever comes my way. I deserve this. And he submits to the consequences. He submits to God's judgment. Fifth, the criminal, he also acknowledges the holiness and the righteousness and the perfection and the innocence of Jesus. He says in verse 41, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong. Like Jesus, he wants all of us to come to this conclusion, okay? Like Jesus, he wants all of us to acknowledge his perfection. Jesus wants us to realize that he was perfect in our place. Right or wrong, praise or blame, good and bad, makes no, it made no difference to the first criminal. Like, it, it made no difference when it came to himself or when it came to Jesus. Like, I don't care if you're innocent or not. Like, you know, I'm casting blame on you regardless. But you have to understand what the second criminal did, acknowledging the holiness of God, acknowledging that there is a difference that makes a difference to Jesus. If Jesus was not perfect and righteous and holy, then understand we cannot be saved by him and he cannot save others. He can't truly pay for the sins of others. So we have to be able to say, like the second criminal, but this man has done nothing wrong. So when we come before Christ, we say, Jesus, you're perfect and holy. You are perfect and holy. You've done nothing wrong. You are right and I am wrong. You are sinless and I am sinful. This man only does what is good. This man only speaks the truth, he says. Six, the criminal acknowledges Jesus is king. He says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kingdom, that's, like, that's insane. Think about this. This confession is amazing. To confess a man with a crown of thorns as king, as he's dying beside you. Uh, to confess someone who's also on the cross, dying a sinner's death as king. Um, to confess that this man in the center who claims to be the Messiah, who claims to be the king, that he has a kingdom. And in that kingdom means he has power and he has glory and might, even though he's being crucified just like us. So not only does the second criminal go against the cultural flow of hate and rejection. Not only does he fear God, not only does he admit that he's a sinner, not only does he admit that he deserves punishment for his sins, not only does he admit the holiness and perfection of Jesus, not only does he admit Jesus as king, but finally, this criminal, or rather I should say this repentant or penitent criminal does one more thing. He pleads for grace and mercy. I don't care what others say about you, Jesus. I know I'm a wretch. I know God is to be feared. I know that I deserve my punishment. I know I deserve my death. I know that your perfection can have nothing to do with my imperfection. I know that your holy kingdom can't ever accept a sin-stained criminal like myself. But please, please, he says, remember me. Remember me. There was no demand. There was no 
attitude of entitlement. There's no, no, like remember, both criminals, right? Criminal one and two, they both want to be saved from death. But one makes a sinful demand, prove yourself, prove yourself. And one says in a humble cry and in desperation, would you remember me? And what's amazing is that he had nothing to offer before the cross. This criminal, he had nothing to offer on the cross and he will have nothing to offer after the cross either. There's nothing he can offer in exchange for his soul. He, he, can't, give, he can't offer a life of obedience. He, 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 can't pay, he can't do good work to pay back society for all the wrongdoings for his life of crime. He can't get baptized and join a church and completely have a, a 180 turn and just live a new life. No, this guy, he admits he's a sinner. He admits that he's guilty. He admits that he deserves judgment. And all he could do at that moment, because all he could do, was to cry out for mercy. Jesus, remember me. And that's the point, people. Jesus is not looking for people who, can, who think they can contribute to their salvation. Jesus isn't looking for the bravest and brightest. He's not looking for the one who's got a perfect, intact marriage. He's not looking for the one whose kids go to an Ivy League school. He's not looking for the ones who think in any shape or form that they are somehow owed by God a tiny bit, that they even deserve even a fraction of God's goodness. But Lord, I've done so much for you. I've given so much for you. Look at how much I've served you. That God, shouldn't I now deserve or owe get, or or receive some of your blessings from because of what I've done? No. We are to look and act as that thief in the last hour of his life. You know, as believers, we are constantly called to come before him in desperation. And maybe that's where you are right now. Especially during this quarantine, going through what you're going through, maybe there's a helplessness that you are feeling. But we need to come before him with that helplessness. It is not a weakness. But really, it is an opportunity for you to seek after the strength and the will of God in your weakness, in your desperation, in your helplessness, in your helplessness, knowing that we have guilt, knowing that we've messed up, knowing that we're not doing everything perfectly, knowing that we have nothing possibly good to offer. We have to now absolutely depend upon the grace and mercy of Jesus. God, give me your grace today to sustain me to allow me to be with my family, to allow me to work, to allow me to find work, to allow me to just thrive in this type of crazy environment, situation, circumstance that I'm in. I, 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 I'm desperate for you. Are you desperate for him? This criminal, he said, I know I deserve death, but I beg for your forgiveness. I beg for your, for, for your mercy. Jesus, will you remember me? Maybe for some of us here right now, we're trying to live our lives by our own strength. That we think I'm still owed more because we compare ourselves constantly to other people, right? Yeah, if you do that, you need to repent of that. We should never do that. Comparative holiness is never a good thing. It, it is a self-righteous thing. It is a proud thing. It is a damning thing. Don't do that. You need Jesus, Father, forgive them. And then today you will be with me in paradise. And that really summarizes the good news of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sin and to give us eternal life. That's why Jesus didn't come down from the cross. He could have. But he didn't come down to save himself. He stayed there to die for you and me. That is what we call the commitment of Christ in our lives. The commitment. Our lives, our souls, our everything Right now, what you're going through, everything is in his hands. He stayed up on the cross for you and me. And so now, therefore, we can rest assured that same commitment is here for us today and for the rest of our days. He is here for you. Be encouraged, GHC. Be encouraged and know that the Lord is with you. I urge you now every single day, would you come before him and say, Jesus, would you remember me? And in your desperation, plead. And in your and as you grovel in humility, say, God, remember me. I need you. I am broken. I have nothing to offer you but my sins. I have nothing to offer you but my, but my own self-centeredness. Lord, would you, would you take me? Would you lead me? Would you revive me? I need you. Remember me, O oh Lord. Let's pray. 
Gracious Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. I just, and Lord, we just want to lift up these words to you. The gospel of Jesus, that you would remember us and in your promise that you promised that we will be with you in paradise. And what is it that we could have possibly ever done to deserve that? And that is nothing. And yet it is by your grace and mercy that you saved us. Brothers and sisters, I want to give you just a few seconds to respond to the words that you've heard. Holy Spirit's prompting you. He's speaking to you. The words are challenging you as well. And I pray that the words will coax you back to him and understanding that God is a God who forgives and he's a loving God and that he's beckoning for you. Come to me. I will remember you. I will always remember you. And now at this time, um, if you have the, uh, if you have your, if you have your Lord's Supper, the communion set up, the elements of the juice or um, the bread or cracker or whatever it is that you have here, I want to ask that you take this again. This is for those who are believers in your household. Uh, whether it's your roommate or family members, but if they're a believer, they can join us. This is an open communion. And, um, but if you have children, or if you have those who are around you who are not believers, who have not professed faith in Christ Jesus, let this kind of pass from them. Instead, to you, I want to encourage you to reflect on what you've just heard and, and just, um, just ask the Lord, God, would you, if you're real, if you're true, not that prove yourself, but I want to know you. I want to be desperate for you. Would you open my heart to you, Lord? And so with these, um, this is, a, this is a, a time of worship, of self-examination. As we know, we do this every Sunday. But it is a time where we get to, as believers, examine our own hearts. I can't judge you. I can't judge the people around. You know what you're going through. And sometimes we even deceive ourselves too. So this is where we really kind of hunker down and dig deep into the, to the, to the recess of our hearts and say, God, if there's sin in my life that I've disguised or if there are things in my life that I'm harboring, um, Lord, I just want to repent that and release that to you. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's anger. Uh, maybe it's frustration. Maybe it's unbelief that you have before the Lord. I, God, I really don't trust you. It's been four weeks now. And I don't have a job where I'm about to lose my job or I'm just frustrated with my job or with my family or whatever it is. I just want to lift this up before you, God. Would you take this from me? And so, yeah, would you release that to the Lord? Examine your own heart that you don't come before him with the sin. Um, and so let's take a moment and just kind of in prayer. Uh, I'm going to lead you all through this. Let's just bow our heads. Okay. Father, we thank you um, again for this opportunity to, to have this Lord's Supper with our believers, with the body of believers here. What a, what a true uh, privilege it is, Lord, that we can do this, even if it is done virtually, God. Um, we know that we are one in spirit. We are the body of Christ Jesus. You are the head. Uh, I want to read this passage here for us. In 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what else I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you so much for just your amazing sacrifice. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you would send your son to die on our behalf. Lord, we know that... Um, that there was such pain and sorrow that led to this great sacrifice, and it's all because of our sins. So we, Father, uh, in humility and in desperation, Lord, we all we can say is really is say is say sorry to you that you would forgive us, and in that forgiveness, Lord, we know that because of Jesus, we can partake in this as a fellowship of believers, those who have been covered and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But Lord, we also want to take this in a manner that's worthy of this great sacrifice. And so, we, God, we thank you again for this most holy, holy moment. Uh, Lord, we offer this up to you, God, to remember you, to worship you, and to honor you. Jesus, our lives are, our, our lives are lived in freedom and lived in grace and lived in mercy 
because of your grace and mercy, not because we are owed it, not because we deserve it, but Lord, because you simply looked upon us and in your love and in your faithfulness and in who you are, God, you extended all these rich mercies and grace upon us. So we thank you. And so now we take this to remember you in the great sacrifice, the shed blood of Christ and his body. God, we honor you and we love you and we worship you through this. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join me. And now if you're sitting down, I want to encourage you to stand up. I would love to just do the benediction um, and lift you guys up and close in prayer. And I would also encourage you guys, even afterwards, if you want to sing a couple songs as a family before you end the evening, please do so. Um, and, uh, and just enjoy this time. Enjoy this time, this day that the Lord has made. We can rejoice in it. God is faithful. God is good. May there be a smile upon your face. May your hearts be glad. And, um, and this is such a wonderful opportunity. So I'm glad for, uh, to have you all tuning in today. Uh, remember, tomorrow morning, there is a Saturday morning uh, mini sermon as well. And then, on, obviously, on Easter Sunday, please join us for the live stream uh, virtual Sunday service at 9.30 for the kids and then 10.05 for the adults. So let me just pray. Father, God, we thank you again for your rich love and mercy and grace. Uh, without it, Lord, we know that we are we are um, lost forever and there is nothing, there will be nothing good that could ever come out of this. But Lord, you are the one who chose us and you are the one who saved us and you are the one who redeemed us. And so we simply want to honor you. That's all we can do. Worship is simply just responding back to what you've done. We've done nothing. You've done everything, God. You've already blessed us and you've already loved on us and you've already encouraged us and you're already leading us every step of every day. So all we can do simply is to honor you and praise you. Um, and so, God, would you continue just to be lifted high in our lives? We thank you for this moment, for this time. Continue to be with our families and our friends here who are joining in. And I pray that they are encouraged and blessed through your word, Jesus, because you are mighty to save. And for those who don't know you, God, may they just may they surrender themselves before you today. And would you knock at their hearts? And that you would, that they would see just the reality, the, the power and the might and just the truth of who you are, Jesus, that you are a Savior and King, that you are the great Messiah. And so now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And I, I hope to catch you guys in the next uh, day and obviously on Sunday as well. God bless.